is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Do you think you are what they say you are? You remember that day when Saul, who was persecuting Christians, was on the road to Damascus? And a blinding light came and he fell down and the first question he asked was, Who art thou, Lord? Who is Jesus? Why cannot we escape him? Why is he in our conscience and in our mind so that our plays and our poems and our operas are about him? Is he just a revolutionary hero? Or is he something more? He only lived 33 years. He never traveled more than 100 miles. He never had any formal education. And yet 2,000 years later, an entire generation is talking about Jesus Christ. Some say that he was a madman. Some of the people of his day said he was mad, said he was a maniac. Was he? There were others that said he was revolutionary. He'd come to lead a revolution. Was he a revolutionary? In the sense that he changed men's lives, he was, but he never led a revolution against Rome. He never led a revolution against the existing authorities. As a matter of fact, some of them tried to get him to and some of them thought he was going to. And when they found out that he was building a spiritual kingdom, they were no longer interested in him. Or was Jesus an establishment man? Jesus Christ is not the establishment Christ. He's building another kingdom. He's building an eternal kingdom. And then there's some people that say that he was the first hippie. They said he had long hair, went around with his disciples in a commune. You know, actually, we don't know what he looked like. We don't have a picture of Jesus, and God did that purposely so that we would not be worshiping an image because God is a spirit and must be worshiped in spirit. And then there were people that said that he was deliberately evil, that he was an evil man, that he was a devil. What was he? That's the question. Jesus Christ, who are you? Who is Jesus? We can't escape him. We try to run from him, but there he is. He keeps popping up everywhere. Our greatest philosophers write about him. Our greatest historians write about him. Our greatest poems and plays are about him. They can't escape him. Well, we know some things about him. We know he was a man. Jesus was completely human. He was representative of man because the Bible says he was identified, he was numbered with the transgressors. We know that he was hungry, we know he got thirsty, we know he got tired. We know that he had the joys of friendship, we know that he wept at the tomb of a dead loved one. We know that he had all the characteristics of a man and yet very interestingly the Bible says that he never committed a sin. In fact, he stood in front of the people of his generation and he said, I've never committed a sin. He said, if any of you, my neighbors, ever seen me commit a sin, they couldn't say a thing. Now, wouldn't that be something for a man to come along, 33 years of age, and say, who of you have ever seen me commit a sin? All of us are sinners, but Jesus was tempted in every point like as we are. He went through every temptation you've ever been through. There isn't a trial or a testing or a temptation that Jesus has not been through before you and he resisted them and overcame them all. Everyone, he was a man. Just like you. But he was more than that. He claimed to be the unique, only begotten, 
incarnate Son of God. In fact, he claimed pre-existence. The scripture says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Before time began, he existed. He said, before Abraham was, I am. I am in eternal existence. No wonder they got angry. No wonder they threw stones at him. No wonder they tried to kill him. And no wonder they eventually did crucify him. He stood and said, I am God. Was he? Was he who the, he claimed to be? The son of the living God? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, Peter, you've done well. You've passed your examination. But Peter, those are not your thoughts. Those thoughts came from God. It has been revealed to you by God. Jesus Christ claimed to be the Son of the living God. From everlasting to everlasting, He is God, the Bible says. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, the Logos, the Word of God, the eternal God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and lived like a man among us. He wasn't just another revolutionary. He wasn't just another hippie. He was not just another great man. He was God in the flesh. And oh, the ethics that he taught. Never a man spake like that man. When you get hit on one side, he says, turn the other cheek. Jesus taught that we're to forgive. He taught a revolution in the way we're to live. He taught us that it wasn't just our outward actions that God judges, but it's the inward thoughts and intents. He said, Moses said that in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you even look on a woman to lust after her, you've already committed it. He said, Moses said, thou shalt not murder. But I tell you, if you have hate in your heart against your brother without cause, you're already guilty. He lifted man's ethics to the highest plane and demanded that we live that kind of a life. He himself lived that kind of a life. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Jesus said, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and thefts and blasphemies. All the evil in the world comes from the human heart. That's got to be changed. And that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be converted. You must have a new beginning. Jesus Christ, are you what you say you are? You know, they only brought three charges against him to crucify him. One, they said, this man loves sinners. That was one charge. The second, he healed on the Sabbath day. And the third, he claimed to be the Son of God. Was he the Son of God? Look at his authority. Jesus came unto them and spake unto them, saying, All authority has been given to me. I know one thing. He forgave sin, and no prophet ever did that. Jesus himself forgave sin. He said, Thy sins are forgiven thee. I know that he had authority over nature. One day, he, one night, he was in a storm. The lightning was flashing, the thunder was roaring, the sea was raging, the wind was blowing, the disciples were afraid, and Jesus was asleep in the boat, and he stood up in the boat and said, Peace be still. The lightning quit its flashing, and the thunder quit its roaring, and the rain ceased to fall, and the wind quieted down, and the sea quieted down, and nature obeyed him. He calmed the sea. He had power over nature. 
But Jesus could take a storm like that and turn it around. He could take the lightning and throw it back in the cloud. He has power over nature. Why? Because he's the God of nature. Those are his laws. They're obeying him. He had authority over disease. But Jesus did make the blind to see. He made the deaf to hear. He made the dumb to talk. He raised the dead. He had authority over demons. And Jesus confronted demons time after time, and he could cast them out. And people that were insane under the powers of demons would regain their sanity. And then look at the death he died. Did ever a man die like Jesus? The lightning flashed and the thunder roared and the earth began to shake. And even the soldiers confessed that this must be the Son of God. Anyone that can see Jesus on that cross and not be touched has a heart of stone. They first took off his clothes. Then they took long leather thongs with steel pellets or lead pellets on the end and beat him across the back until he could hardly stand up. Then they put a crown of thorns on his brow and his face was bleeding. And they laughed at him and they spit on him and they mocked him. And with one snap of his finger, 72,000 angels had already drawn their swords ready to come to his rescue and wipe this planet out of existence in the universe. And Jesus said, no, to this end was I born. And he dragged and lifted and hauled that cross. Don't ever say it's a white man's religion or a black man's religion. It's a world religion. He belongs to the world. When he died on that cross, and they nailed him. They put the nails in his hands. And you know what he said? Forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. Could you forgive somebody that's putting nails in your hands and you know you didn't deserve it? He didn't squirm, he didn't yell, he didn't scream. He just took it and said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's how he confronted the violence of his day. And then, on the cross, he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he dropped his head and said, it's finished. What did he mean? He meant your plan of salvation was finished. God can now forgive you of all your sins because Jesus had finished God's plan for your salvation. Because you see, God knows every one of you by name. He has the hairs of your head numbered. God looks upon you as though you were the only person in the whole universe. He sees you and you alone. And on that cross, Jesus had the capacity to think of you. And he loved you enough to stay on the cross. Was there ever such love as that? When he could have been rescued and taken back to heaven and to sit on his throne, but he didn't. He said, no. I'm doing it for the joy that is set before me. Because he saw that he would be raised from the dead. He saw that there would be a gathering in the generations to come of a people for his name that would make up his body. He saw the day when we will reign with him in his kingdom. Yes, they laid him away in a tomb. And if you don't have the resurrection, you don't have any gospel. Jesus Christ is alive. And when they went out to the tomb that morning, they heard the greatest news the world has ever known. He is not here. He is risen. He is alive today. And the thing that inspired the disciples to turn the world upside down in their day was the resurrection. They went everywhere declaring that Jesus is alive. 
You know, some of us Christians live as though Jesus is dead. He's not dead. He's alive. The moment you receive Christ, you see all the world is going this way. You turn around and start against the tide as a Christian. And that's hard. But you know, it's hard to be a sinner too, the older you get, because the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Jesus Christ is alive. And if he's not risen from the dead, if he's not alive, then there is no such thing as Christianity. We're yet in our sins, Paul said, and the whole thing's a farce, forget it. Who art thou, Lord? Jesus Christ, are you who you say you are? This is the question that every one of you today are going to have to answer. Who is Jesus? If Jesus claimed to be God, knowing he wasn't God, then he's a liar. And we will have to say, Jesus, you're a liar. You're a fraud and a hoax, and you're the biggest fraud in the history of the human race. Or that he was who he claims to be, God in the flesh. I believe that the evidence is overwhelming that he is who he claims to be, the son of the living God but I cannot prove it scientifically. But I can prove it by the lives that he transforms every day. I can prove it because in my heart, I don't say I think, I hope, I say I know. And you know, there's another element in our lives that we don't think much about, and that's the element of faith. You think of the faith that you have to have every day. You have to have faith in the bank. When you write a check and sign it, and you have money in the bank, you have to have faith that the bank's gonna pay it. You have to have faith in the government. When you pull out a dollar bill, now I know it's shrinking, but you have faith that back of it is a dollar, that people will accept it as money. Faith, faith, faith. Everything. When you sat in that chair, had you ever sat in that chair before? I bet you didn't pick it up and examine it and put your hands on it to see if it'd hold you. By faith, you just sat down in it. You had faith that people wouldn't build a chair that wouldn't hold you. Everything we do is by faith. All right, take the same faith. Put it in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you will know who Jesus is. You accept him by faith and he comes into your life and into your heart and you know that he's who he claims to be. Now some of you can ridicule. Some of you can reject him. Some can just put it off and say, I'm going to wait till another time. Or you can accept it as your Lord and your Savior and your Master and the Son of God. And He will come into your heart and forgive your sin and change your life.